أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بسير بالعباد ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ونعم المولى ونعم النصير والصلاة والسلام وتحية والإكرام على الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا وقل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الدين عند الله الإسلام صدق الله العلي العظيم زين مجالسكم بالصلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد My respected elders, brothers and sisters and iman salamun alaykum jamiyan wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh What is the goal of your life? What is the goal of your education? Keep those two questions in the back of your mind inshallah we'll return to them We've discussed a substantial amount of information up to this point and built on the concept that, concept that we began with. The ideas of modernity, the ideas of philosophy, the ideas of ethics, and the ideas of spirituality. With our ultimate goal being to try to achieve spirituality in our lives by virtue of proper ethics and by virtues of proper thinking in the Islamic framework. Today, I want to discuss some of the crisis of modern societies. What is the crisis of modernity, number one, and how is it relevant to us today? And how do we use that to try to reconcile religion and modernity? Number one. Number two, well, I want to look at what does Islam say with respect to this? What is Islam's perspective on this? Is Islam somehow against modernity or does is Islam for modernity? Is Islam neutral? What's the Islamic perspective and how can we implement this in our lives? And number three. What is some of the science saying in, with respect to what are the things that we can perhaps adopt in our personal lives, in our communities, in our societies, so that we can get practical solutions that are within also the Islamic framework that we can implement so that we can have more fruitful, positive, well-being oriented and happy lives. This is the focus of our conversation today, inshallah. The first point that I want to discuss is modernity. How did society change from in the last 200 and 250 years? How has society changed in a way that it's different today? And why is that important for us looking at society living in 2020? I want to take us back to 1760. And this was a turning point in the history of the world. What did the world look like at that point in time? It was that moment in time where we were seeing a shift, we were seeing a movement that was going away from these dynasties or these ruling classes that were in a particular era and just ruling over their particular regions and actually moving more and more towards, for example, global colonialism. And with that, we saw the rise of what we now call modernity, marking that era of 1760 and the likes. And when this happened, you notice that in certain regions and pockets, there were certain dynasties and invasions and things of this happening. For example, if you look at the, the Indian subcontinent, you would have the Mughals who were from, uh, were relatively, uh, were not indigenous to that population. They were not locals. They had come from other places, for example, and they had their territories in place. But as time progressed, they lost some of their territories in India, for example, to uh, other local rulers. And they're their domain began to get smaller, for example. At the same time, throughout the globe, you had similar phenomena occurring. And so it gave rise to colonialism in the form of many countries, uh, such as Spain, such as Portugal, such as the United Kingdom. And many of these began to see opportunities across the globe, colonize lands and take resources and use it for their particular lands. At that time, in 1760, the richest place per capita in the world, actually, was the Caribbean. That is, uh, it, it was that place that was so vibrant because it had one resource that was extremely, extremely valuable to the world, and that was sugar. And this sugar would be exploited in that region and brought towards Europe. This is all very important to understand what happened and how did we get here. The reason I'm mentioning this is because at that time, Europeans didn't necessarily have a appetite for sugar, nor for coffee for that matter as much either. But this is where individuals saw this 
and saw a business opportunity, an economic opportunity here, particularly uh, regions such as Spain and Portugal and the United Kingdom. And they began to take that territory and bring these resources back to their countries. And in light, 1760 and beyond that led to what we now call modernity. So what, how are societies changing in modernity from what was one model that was a traditional model to the modern model? What happened there? So I mentioned the resources that were being brought, for example, the sugar and the coffee. This actually gave rise to the concept and the reinvention of the concept of breakfast in Western Europe that came to America as well. So sugar and coffee became a staple of, for example, the breakfast. Another uh, crop that they used was tobacco as well on a side note. So what was the, how was society changing from in traditional to modern and how can we understand that as Muslims living in the modern era and the modern society? Well, what was happening as part and parcel of this is three main elements among many others were the highlight. Well, energy was changing. How was energy changing? Energy was changing from natural man-made energy and was, was natural energy that is found in the land through uh, God's resources. Uh, and it was moving towards more man-made structures. For example, it was starting out with, with those things that were coal and moving towards, for example, steam or coal engines. These things were becoming more man-made, natural, uh, moving from natural towards man-made. That was one movement, the energy movement. Number two was the economic movement. Before that, in, before 1760, you'd be surprised to know less than 10% of the world population actually lived in cities. Most of them lived in rural localities. They lived in suburbs or far out from the suburbs, the rural uh, isolation in towns. In fact, less than 15% lived in towns. That means a town was defined by 2,000 or less uh, people, 2,000 or more people, I should say. And so what was happening here was you had people who were living in very rural locations and most of them were farming. And industrialization, increased in modernity, industrialization increased and urbanization increased. So you saw people moving away from this, uh, from farming and moving away from the outskirts of town and living on their own and going into the cities and actually building their lives into the cities. And when they did this, this caused another movement. And the third element of the movement from traditional societies to modern societies is what I, what I really wanted to highlight. Sociologists and historians have highlighted a very particular shift that happened from a traditional society to a modern society, where in a traditional society, people had unstable lives, but stable, stable communities. What does that mean? Their lives were unstable in the sense that they could have a plague, similar to what we're enduring today. They could have a situation where, for example, their life was taken at any moment because of an accident. They didn't have insurance. They didn't have any protections. They could get sick. At any moment, their particular individual lives were unstable, but their communities, historians say, were stable. They had a stable sense of community in the sense that if something happened to them, there were still some types of protections. Maybe somebody in the community, in the society would look after a loved one, or there were some elements of a sense of community that was still stable and still strong. Why? Because people typically didn't move very often from place to place in, prior to 1760. People were living in the same town, in the same geography, in the same dynamics uh, their entire lives. You would marry the person who was down the street from you. You lived in the same community, the same. Everyone knew each other. That's how life was. But the shift that happened in modern societies, according to historians and sociologists, is we moved from unstable individual lives and stable communities to stable individual lives and unstable communities. Why is that significant? Why is that important? The reason that's significant, the reason that's important is because an individual may have a stable income in the modern society. They may have a stable job for themselves, their families, things of this nature. They may be stable in those sense as an individual, but they don't have a stable sense of community in the modern era. Why? Because people move around more. I get a job in this city. I get a job in this city, this country. I am willing to move across the globe for economic goals. And through that process, I don't make uh, those connections that I had before. In fact, research has shown a lot of times that after the age of 30, it's much more difficult to make uh, friendships and new connections. And so when someone's constantly moving from city to city to town to town, not that I'm saying that that's not necessarily something bad. Rasulullah, the Ahlul Bayt, had examples of this, of migration, no doubt about it. 
But when someone constantly does this and doesn't at the same time focus on a concept or a sense of community, what happens as a byproduct of this is you lose your sense of meaning. You lose your sense of belonging. You lose your sense of purpose. You lose your sense of being part of something bigger than yourself. And this has negative impacts on the mind and the psyche of the mind. It can lead to greater sense of isolation, greater sense of loneliness, greater sense of anxiety, greater sense of depression. All of these things emerge from this dynamics of stable individual lives, but unstable communities that we face and we see in modernity and industrial economies. That's the first level of analysis, how our society has shifted given the, the, the dynamics of the changing world. Islam, the second level of analysis that I come, want to come to, what is Islam's perspective in this? Is Islam against modernity? Is Islam for modernity? Is Islam neutral on modernity? What's the view? You see, with respect to the last point in particular, the concept of community, and in particular, I would say stable community within Islam is extremely important. Why did Islam emphasize, for example, the masjid, the masajid, the mosques, going to the mosque five times a day or three times a day, going for the five prayers to make sure you're there? Not only was it about, for example, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to God Almighty, which is the primary focus, but it wasn't just that. Because when we go to pray, we're not only praying, we're supposed to greet the people to our left and our right. We're asking them, we were supposed to at least ask them, how are you doing? How's life? Is there anything that I can be of service to you? Is there anything I can help you with? You know, sometimes in our communities, we live in this, we've adopted this model of the stable individual life and the unstable community that I alluded to of modernity in our own communities, whether we realize it or not. What do I mean? You know, in 2007 to 2009, as a community, the global community, we faced one of the greatest crises. Uh, crises, the financial collapse, the Great Depression, as it was called. During that time, some people were there and helping, alhamdulillah, and may Allah reward all of those who were and are and have good intent. I'm not here to make any judgments on anyone. But what I'm saying here is sometimes in some of the letters and some of the communications that I received as a speaker from people were that, you know, we were meeting people and acting as if everything was the same. And some people were suffering tremendously, but nobody came to ask them. And they didn't maybe feel comfortable asking otherwise. There has to be this comfortable channel where people can actually communicate with one another, even in hardship, and not live in this silo culture of uh, silos, like the coming from the farms. What's a silo? In the past, or in even in common era today, when you want to store grains, corn, or flour, or wheat at the farm, they have silos, which are these long towers that keeps corn in one, flour in one, maize, all these other different crops in one silo. But the silos don't touch each other, they don't communicate, they don't overlap. And it seems that sometimes in our own lives, we may have individuals in our community, alhamdulillah, they're doing stable, but are we opening those channel, channels of communication where anyone feels comfortable coming to me as a brother or a sister to a sister and saying, I need help, I need assistance, I need help, and would you be able to help me? And that's where stable community comes into place. I say this in particular because this is a point of reflection. In COVID-19, we've moved to this, this uh, model of technology and using it because of the necessity of the time and the era. But what about after this? What about when we move away from and things start to open up, whether that's in six months or, or 12 months? I don't know. But whenever a vaccine emerges, whenever there's a solution society, and whenever we are ready to move on as a community and society, Will we get complacent and say that this is the model that we'll adopt forever, that we're going to just stay? Well, it, I, I thought it was pretty comfortable watching lectures online from the convenience of my home. I'm going to stick to that and I'm going to stay with that. And I don't need to go to the mosque anymore. I don't need to go to the Husseiniyah anymore. I don't have as much importance for that anymore because, look, I've adapted. And I think this is what is needed. And this is what fits in with my busy life. Yes, there's many pros of technology on the one side. I'm a big proponent of technology. Anyone who tells you, for example, technology is all bad blanket statement is not necessarily looking at all the dimensions of the equation. Technology is extremely important for society to progress. But we as human beings, if you remember the last point I made, that what sociologists and historians have said about modernity, it's led to unstable communities. 
And we, by human nature, need a sense of community. We need a sense of belonging. We need a sense of friendship. We need a sense of relationships. If you remember the PERMA model, which I explained, the variables that scientists look at, psychologists look at to determine happiness and well being in life, well, what were those? The primary one, the R in PERMA, actually stands for relationships. It's the most important dimension of happiness and well being in one's life. Well, if we adopt this model where we're constantly uh, the, using technology to communicate and not complementing that with a sense of community in the mosque, in the Hosseini, in the Imam Barga, 12 months down the line, six months down the line, however long down the line when things open up, we get complacent with this model, you will notice that anxiety, depression, loneliness, that will continue to uptick the way it is upticking right now with COVID-19. People are feeling a sense of isolation. People are feeling a sense of anxiety. People are feeling a sense of depression. People are, and these are on the uptick because we're not used to this in society. We're not used to being isolated. This is not what we're necessarily designed for. And so it's very important for us to look at the Islamic perspective, that the culture of Islam, the ethos of Islam, the, the manhaj of Islam, the school of thought of Islam was you have a responsibility and a sense of community at the masjid, at the Husayniya. The first is the masjid, then the Imam Bargah, the Husayniya. That's a part of our community. That's a part of our culture. That's a part of our being that helps make us who we are. And we need to take those majalis very seriously. It would be when things open up, not at this time, but when things open up, the majalis of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam should be packed. They should be filled because that helps to create the culture of Adha. That helps to create the culture of our identity so that we are able to have a sense of camaraderie, a sense of brotherhood, a sense of fraternity, a sense of belonging amongst one another. Otherwise, we get the same sense of unstable communities, which leads to depression, anxiety, loneliness, isolation, which causes us decreases in mental tranquility. So that's the next level and with respect to there's the, the massages, the Husseiniya. The third, neighbors and Islamic thought. In the Islamic perspective, neighbors are not just those individuals who, for example, are are those people, for example, who are next to us, left and right. It's 40 houses in Islamic thought, east, west, north, south. I'm responsible for 40 houses, east, north, east, south, northwest. If they have not eaten and I have eaten, I could be liable on the day of judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the traditions that are ascribed to our Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam. As you know, it's very, you have to be very precautious when you are uh, in a state of fasting in particular. You have to be precautious about narrating traditions and hadith in general, but especially when you're in the state of, uh, of fasting, you have to be even more particular about them. So it has been attributed to the Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam, that 40 houses in each direction, that's 160 around. I am responsible for that. That's part and parcel of a sense of community, of a sense of identity, of a sense of belonging. If I have, I must try to share. I I must try to help out. And those are very important pieces of the equation. Now, what are some potential solutions? What are some potential solutions that you and I and we can adopt in order to build our communities and teach people this? And I want to give a very practical solution here. What do I mean? I wanted to go to the questions that I asked at the beginning of our conversation uh, today. What is that? What is your goal in life? In two words or less, Tell me what is the goal of your life? What would you like to, uh, what skill would you like to have? What goal would you like to have in your life in two words or less? Think about that for just a second. Well-being, happiness, things of this come to mind. Very good. So you want to be happy. You want to have one well-being. You may say a sense of accomplishment. You may say, for example, uh, relationships. All of these are good answers in two words or less. Now. I want to speak for in particular to educationalists in our community. I want to speak to teachers. I want to speak to people who run madrasas, people who run full-time Islamic schools, people who run Sunday schools, Saturday schools, Islamic institutions, people who are part of the education system. Because I remember, if you remember, in light of the words of Sayyid Hakim, Islam has one unequivocal goal, and that is to enable its followers to pursue excellence. And the way it allows its followers to pursue excellence is by, under, by knowledge and learning. Learning. That's why so many verses of the Quran have focused on knowledge and learning. And this is not simply Islamic sciences. We've made this difference of Islamic sciences and the likes. Why do I say that? We have in our traditions that when there were POWs in the aftermath of a war, for example, 
wars would happen in society when the muslims had pow's or the opposition took pow's prisoners of war after the war they would take prisoners rasulullah as was the normal custom he would also take pow's but of course he was not harming torturing these individuals you know what the rahma of allah manifested through rasulullah was how he showed it and this is this culminates in mercy as well as knowledge he told some of these people when the muslims fought other armies and they took prisoners of war these people who were prisoners of war were not necessarily muslims they were people from other they were not they were from other groups they were from other tribes they were from other communities he said that you one of the ways that you can go free and you can be you get your freedom is what you teach 10 people from our community knowledge the question i have is did those people who rasulullah said you're right now under our custody but if you teach 10 people you are free to go you have won your freedom if you teach people my question is were those people experts in fiqh islamic jurisprudence were those people experts in in for example the islamic tenets were those people experts in 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 the concepts of tawhid adala nabuwa imam qiyamah that's usul din were those people experts in for example furu' din for example salah sawm the the ahkam were they they didn't know about it that means that he was teaching he was telling them teach them how to write teach them how to learn those were what we would now call secular sciences but in light of the teachings of said sistani and other scholars when asked about what advice for our younger generation said sistani in his beautiful letter that he gives that i recommend everywhere i go of advice to young people he says try to excel in education try to specialize in something and then finally the most beautiful point in my opinion which he states is don't just absorb knowledge contribute to knowledge why is it not that the your name the books that you study in chemistry and biology and physics and economics and mathematics those books why do they not have your name on the front so that not only you benefit other people benefit from the knowledge that you derive as followers of ahlul bayt we should be at the forefront of knowledge therefore i want to give a practical solution to educationalists in our community what is that adopting the model of positive psychology and resilience education in our communities so i asked what's your goal and this was asked by researchers at the university of pennsylvania at uh, in the uk government and also in australia what was the question asked what's your goal in life what do you want to achieve in life and the answer unequivocally came forward wellness well-being and happiness well then the next question is well what does your school teach you think about that for a second in two words or less tell me what does your school teach you and the answers that come back often are discipline or memorization and things of this nature why is it that there is no overlap between what your goal is in life and what the educational system teaches this raises this issue and this point that you and i should notice is that there is a gap between what are our goals in life happiness well being fulfillment and what the traditional educational system teaches that is memorization that is discipline and accord of these natures that means there's a gap between these two and there's a need to fill this gap that is a educational system that not only gives you your well being and happiness but also gives you the discipline and all of those elements that go with traditional schooling this is a sort of a school of life if you will and this is a tremendous opportunities for our sunday schools our saturday schools our madrasas our islamic full time schools to adopt this model so what did they do the researchers at the university of pennsylvania actually started this initiative and they said can we teach these children and align their personal goals with their school goals or their academic goals and can we teach them skills so that they have resilience in their mind and they have a sense of positive identity how did they do this so if a child for example felt lonely at school or at the cafeteria people sit with their own friends their own groups so they took the children and some children came forward and said that you know no one's sitting with me or there i tried to engage with some children or some other co- colleagues and classmates and students and they didn't bring me into their circle and so they asked them well why do you think that is well they begin to the child begins to say or the student begins to say well uh it's because maybe i'm boring maybe i'm weird maybe i don't fit in and they begin to teach and train and ask the child or the student these questions that hold on a second did you notice for a moment that all of those students who are members of the same team they were actually members of the basketball team or they're members of the football team 
And that's not the reason why they didn't want to engage with you. They were actually have a meeting. They were having a meeting for that. And the student begins to realize that, oh no, I, I didn't realize that. I didn't notice that as an example. Or those are people from the same class and they're having a class meeting. And it's not because they don't want to engage with you. And then you start becoming an advocate for the other side of the equation in your own mind. Rather than thinking that people don't want to hang out with me, people don't want to be friends with me, not because I don't, not because I'm weird, but because they're doing something else and I have priorities in my own life. So teaching these skills of positive psychology and resilience. What were the benefits gained from this? What were the benefits gained in these schools from adopting and teaching positive psychology? Well, you notice that the depression rates decreased, their sense of well being increased throughout the board. This was at the level of schools in, in Pennsylvania. Number two, the second level was at schools in the United Kingdom. For our audience in the United Kingdom, you already may be aware of this, some of you. Many of you may not, but there was actually a movement by researchers who collaborate from the University of Pennsylvania and the UK government to actually give training to teachers in positive psychology, in resilience, so that they were teaching their children or the students positive goals that they were able to implement in their life. So what is one teaching, for example, of positive psychology? Well, one of them is what I mentioned yesterday, the PERMA model. There are five elements of what classifies well-being in life that's studied scientifically, that can be measured scientifically. What are those? The positive attitude. I mentioned smiling, for example. That is engagement. That how engaged and engrossed in your work are you? Uh, are relationships. How important and how strong are the relationships that you have in your life? What about meaning and sense of purpose? You know, I, 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 I really want to mention this one because it's the second most important after relationships. And I mentioned a lot about relationships. At the University of Pennsylvania, Adam Grant, a researcher there, he was looking at the Department of Fundraising. For those who are in fundraising, note this point, it will help you in your community because all of us in our communities many times are fundraising. And so the Department of the University of Pennsylvania that was responsible for fundraising, they had to call up their alumni. They had to call up their uh, people who had graduated there and ask them, can we have some donations and things of this nature? And at that moment, many times, most of the time they get a no. But Adam Grant said, how can we possibly help them more? And what they did was they invited people in, the M, the sense of meaning. They invited people who were able to benefit from the work that the fundraisers were doing, people who got scholarships, people who got fellowships, people who got children, students who got education, students who got education through the work of the fundraisers and how it changed their lives. They came into the, the office and began to tell their story. What happened as a result of this? The productivity, the sense of meaning and purpose, and the results that those people, the staff, the fundraising staff that they generated, they shot up. That's the power of having a sense of meaning, why you're doing what you're doing. And the, the final element is accomplishments. Are you accomplishing the goals that you set out for yourself? This is one level. Another level of how you can teach positive psychologies in your madrasa, in your school system, is actually implementing this model of asking people just in the beginning of the day, three things, the, three, the what went well yesterday exercise. Asking three things, and this will come up more and more when we talk about gratitude and gratefulness. But I'm giving a preview now. Asking people just this simple question, list three things that went well yesterday. And they could be as little as you like, they could be as big as you like. It could be that I had a wonderful iftar, for example, I got to spend time with my family and my loved ones, number two. Or it could be, for example, I got to, I got to have a nice cup of tea or a nice cup of coffee or watch my favorite cartoon. Whatever that may be for you, list out those three things. One thing that's very interesting about this is exercises, it can actually be addictive. And what's interesting, it's a good addiction in the sense that it actually promotes well-being in your life, number one, within balance and moderation, of course. And number two, it actually increases your sense of well-being, optimism, and decreases depression and anxiety. It's a very powerful tool to actually think about what went well yesterday. How else was this used? This was rolled out in many UK universities. I want to give the example of Australia. Some headmasters at the most prestigious schools in uh, grammar schools, for example, in Australia, or such as the Geelong uh, Grammar School in Australia, were looking at and reading the research from, from these psychologists, and they said, maybe we can implement this in our school. <clears throat> so they gave a call to these researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, and they said, look, 
we want to raise 60 we want to raise 16 million dollars for a well-being institute within the school and you guys are you as researchers are at the forefront of well-being and well-being research and so i wanted to ask you if you'd be willing we're down two million dollars in terms of fundraising we've collected about 14 million we need to collect another two million we need your help can you help us in this regard so they said, sure, they flew them down, they came down to Sydney, and then they went in front of this audience, in front of the, the parents who would have their students at this uh, institution and who would be part of this institution and in building this wellness center that's part of the school. I wanna bring this to your mind because this implies to our communities very strongly. How? They asked the parents who are there that, what are your goals for your children? And describe those in two words or less. What's your goals for your children? And they all said, we want our children to be happy. We want our children to have well-being. These two things, happiness, well-being. These are what emerged predominantly. Fine. Then the researcher said, okay, now tell me, what is it that this school teaches them? In two words or less. Said, Whoa, okay. Uh, the school teaches, everyone said discipline. The school teaches discipline. There's no doubt about that. The school teaches a tremendous amount of discipline and academic achievement, accomplishment, setting your goals and achieve them. But the main thing that came up was discipline. Why? Because this particular school is where uh, uh, Prince Charles went. Uh, they had a place called Timber Top. Timber Top is that place where the researchers say is a place where you are actually sent in order to learn discipline. So if you want hot water, you have to actually go outside, cut up wood, bring the wood back, light the fire and then actually have some warm water and some warmth. Everything needs to be done by yourself. That leads to you having a sense of self-discipline. So they got this on board that the parents understood that there's a gap between what their goals were for their children and what actually was being taught. So they understood that a well-being center was needed. And so they said, well, how would you implement this? They asked the researchers, if it was up to you, how would you implement positive psychology and resilience training in the in institution. I said, well, very, very, very uh, clear. Number one, we'd give all of the teachers positive psychology and re resilience training. So all of them are trained. So they understand PERMA. They understand the concepts of resilience and how to teach resilience, how to teach the students to say, well, that person was maybe not sitting with you because it's not your fault. It's because maybe they had something going on in their life. It's not your fault. Or for example, somebody who is bullying a student. Bullying is a big problem in, in all communities and ours are no exception. And so for example, when you say that, that this child, you, you weren't being bullied, that bullying is wrong, but you weren't being bullied necessarily because anything's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you as a victim of bullying. This team just lost the basketball game or they lost the baseball game and they're upset that they lost. It's not about you, it's about them. And these types of traits, when you teach children about these and students about this, their dynamics shift. So number one, how can you implement? You teach all the teachers about resilience and positive psychology. Number two, you actually implement an environment where you have a coordinator who's in charge and responsible for all of the initiatives of positive psychology and resilience training in the institution, in the madrasa, in the mambarga school, in the full-time school, the Islamic school, you have someone responsible. And number three, you have a lecture series where people who are experts in this field or people who have studied this field, they come in and lecture on a periodic basis to try to teach those things. When you implement all of these things, you will notice that the dynamics of the school will shift. So what did they do? They actually implemented this and they, they led teacher training. The teachers came in and when they came in, the headmaster or the principal who we'd call in America, who was hired, he was somebody who was just brought in from England, who was very cold and someone who was very, you know, very strict traditional teacher or principal headmaster. He said, they said over two weeks, that individual who was cold and strict shifted to warm and happy and was hugging people and the most joyous person after the training. It come and, and that person, that headmaster's wife uh, said, spouse said that his life has changed because of this training. The idea being that we could potentially implement these things in our own communities because it reduces depression. It actually increases optimism and positivity in society. Many times in my lecturing, and I've been asked wherever I go, alhamdulillah, through the Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam, in Europe, in Amer North America, in India, how can you get youth back to the Imam Barga? How can you get youth back to the Husseiniyah? How can you get youth back to the, to the mosque and the masjid? 
One of the best ways that you and I can do this is perhaps establishing a wellness center, establishing a wellness community within our mosque. What does that mean? It doesn't have to be $16 million. It, has, it could be just a few chairs. It could just be a coffee, like a, a little coffee machine. It could just be a, you know, some place to, that people feel at home and there is an environment and an ecosystem to talk about positive well-being in light of Islam. And what are the akhlaqi, the ethical traits of Islam, the spiritual dimensions of Islam? Believe me, I have this thesis, my dear brothers and sisters and my friends, that the world, when something is a practical solution that helps me in my life, it gets adopted. If you look in the West, in Silicon Valley, throughout America and throughout Europe, on, across the globe, the concepts of, for example, yoga, for example, have been adopted of Hindu spirituality, of Buddhist spirituality, have been adopted by people who don't adhere to the Buddhist faith. They're not Buddhist by practice. They're not even Hindu by practice, but they believe that there is a practical benefit in these teachings of those religions. I believe that if we understand the Islamic spirituality framework, implement it in our lives, and then bring it to the world in, in the forms of books, in the forms of writings, in the forms of implementation, you will notice that people from all across the globe, Muslim or not, will adopt that model. Because many people don't know the rich spiritual dimensions that exist within Islam. They may be limited to simply the poetry of Rumi and Hafiz or things of this nature. But the depths of what the Ahlul Bayt taught, the du'as of Ahlul Bayt the du'as of Imam Sajjad the du'as of Ahlul Bayt, the ziyarat of Ahlul Bayt the teachings and the beautiful words of the Ahlul Bayt, if these were made known to the world, you would notice that people would adopt these in their life. This is my thesis and this is my hypothesis. But why not start in our own madrasas? Why not start in our own Husseinias? Why not start in our own Imam Bargas? Where we implement this model of not only the, the goals. I asked those two questions. That what are your goals for life? Happiness, well-being. What are your goals, for example, within the school framework? But you also have goals where? You also have goals of your spiritual goals. How can we mend and measure and mesh all of these so we create comprehensive individuals that are the best in every dimension of their lives. That's the real premise of what I'm getting at. How can we implement that in our world so we create a better world? This is a challenge and an invitation to educators in our community to see how we can optimize our communities to be better place so, so we can give rise to scholars that we have such as the scholars of the past and the scholars of the present. How can we give rise to more alama tabatabai sahib tafsir al-nizan? How can we give rise to more, more of the likes of Sayyid Sistani, for example? How can we give rise to more ulama, people who have this worldly as well as the secular, as well as the religious, which again, I said, I don't, I'm not a fan of this uh, uh, delimination or I'm not a fan of this, but what I'm driving at is having a comprehensive understanding of this world, which, by the way, if you follow our maraja, many of them have a completely comprehensive or, or as close as you can get understanding of the world. They're not disconnected. We need these types of young people and give rise to them with well-being centers in our communities, in our societies that can look after their needs and well-being. This would be a very, very valuable element going on the first point that I mentioned. Modernity leads to unstable communities. If we can create well-being centers for the general youth in our community, as well as for the madrasa students in particular, you will notice that it will lead to a gravitation and you couple that with the Islamic spirituality and the Islamic teachings of ethics and morality, you will notice, and I'm confident inshallah, we will notice a better world. We will wor notice a world where our youth are not susceptible as much to drugs and alcohol and resorting to all of these other things, which they're using many times as coping mechanisms to fill a void that's in the heart. That's really what's driving it. You have to deal with the issues of the heart. If someone feels empty, if someone feels lonely, if someone feels all of these things, they are more inclined to go towards those vices that I mentioned earlier. If we can be proactive rather than reactive, we have a hope of creating a better world and a better society that you and I can all benefit from. What's another teaching that you can implement? A final note and I'll conclude here. Relationships. How can we implement 
absolutely amazing relationships in our community. What is that? There's a model that I want to share with you, and this is where we'll, we'll conclude. This is part of the teachings in the educational system. What are What is that model? It is active versus passive in terms of and constructive or destructive? Uh, is your communication either active or passive? And is it constructive or destructive? This is one of the most important things for well beings in marriage relationships, in family relationships, in all types of relationships. Are you giving active or passive communication? And is it constructive or destructive? One of the most important things is when a loved one, such as your spouse, tells you something, for example, like they got a promotion at work. How do you respond to them? Do you say, for example, you got a promotion at work. That means that our tax bracket is going to go up and that means we have to pay more taxes. That would be an example of something that's active, destructive. This is the worst form of communication. That's the last thing you want to say to someone. Another form of that is, for example, where you say that, that, that for example, the person comes forward and said, well, congratulations, great job. This, you may think, is a wonderful response, but this, according to researchers, would be classified as passive constructive. It does nothing. It's blank. It's like wallpaper on the wall. It's not very helpful at all. The person doesn't feel acknowledged. What's the best type of response that you can give to someone so they feel fulfilled in life? The best one, according to researchers, is something called active constructive relationships, ACR active constructed, constructive relationships. What happens in active constructive? Your spouse comes and tells you, I got a promotion at work. I landed a big client. I had an amazing, amazing achievement. You stop there and you look at them and you become actively engaged in that individual, your spouse, your, your loved one. And once you become actively engaged, you then say, I read or I saw some of your work and I think it's some of the most amazing work. For example, the report that you wrote, I read it and I feel like this is one of the best reports I've ever read. The design that you created, for example, I felt like it was the best design. You tell them that and then you say, hold on. Well, when you got this promotion, what did your, what did your boss say? What did your manager say? And where did they say it? What did they say and where did they say it? You help that person relive the experience. And when they relive the experience, you actually become active and give them that positive or that constructive feedback they feel whole. This actually increases love. This actually decreases divorce according to statistics. It increases the love in a relationship and decreases divorce in the relationship. Active, constructive feedback. We need to teach this as educators to our communities, in our families, in our homes, and in our lives. Our followers of our community should be the most equipped in this dunya from the science as well as the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhirul da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil. I love you.